Hello everyone and welcome to the webcast. I apologize for starting a few minutes late. We had some technical difficulties, but we're ready to go. Um, my, my name is Christine Dursey and I'm the Executive Director of APA Ohio and Vice Chair of the New Urbanism Division. And I will be the moderator for today's webcast. Today, Friday, September 20th, we will hear the presentation, Where the Boom Babies Grew Up, Post-World War II Era Suburban Tracks and Complexes. And this is a special webcast in that our speaker, Richard Longstreth, is also presenting to a live audience. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen, or call the 1-800 number shown. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the questions box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. We will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. And because this is a special webcast, we will also be getting some questions and um, answers also facilitated during the live portion. Okay, on your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. I'd like to thank all those participating for making these webcasts possible. Today's webcast is sponsored by the Urban Design and Preservation Division. For more information on this division and how to become a member, visit planning.org slash division slash urban design. And to learn more about all our divisions, you can visit planning.org slash divisions. You can always find a list of our upcoming webcasts by visiting www.utah-apa.org slash webcasts. To log your CM credits, visit planning.org slash CM, select the activities by date, select today's date, September 20th, and then select the title, Where the Boom Babies Grew Up. And of course, always like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive all the up-to-date information on the Planning Webcast Series. This is a live recording, and we will have it available on youtube.com slash planningwebcast, where you can find all of our previous webcast videos. And if you'd like a PDF of this presentation, simply email me at planningwebcasts at yahoo.com. And this webcast is also available for 1.5 CM credits. I'd like to now turn it over to Wendy Tinsley Becker, who is the chair of the Urban Design and Preservation Division, and she is going to introduce our speaker. Wendy? Thanks, Christine. I just want to point out we are seeing a black screen, so I'm not sure what the rest of the audience is seeing, but maybe you guys can try to work on that while I'm, I'm giving my introduction. Perfect. Uh, Thank so, you. We'll work on that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of several planning webcasts hosted by a the APA Urban Design and Preservation Division as part of the planning webcast series facilitated by APA Ohio and APA Utah. The Urban Design and Preservation Division is a nationwide community of professionals dedicated to supporting educational and networking opportunities for planners, urban designers, preservationists, and allied professionals. Our members are uniquely concerned with the built environment, particularly issues surrounding urban design, architecture, historic preservation, and the legacy of the planning profession. The goal of the division is to promote these topics within the field of planning and within APA while building partnerships with allied professionals and organizations. In recent years, the division has received the Division Achievement Award for Branding Excellence, the Division Achievement Award for Education Excellence, and the Division Achievement Award for Best Newsletter. And the division maintains active programs, including an annual fellowship, writing campaigns like My One City and My Third Place, and sponsorship of Planners Press books, including Planning Los Angeles, edited by David Sloan, and In Motion, The Experience of Travel by Tony Hiss. Current efforts that we're working on are directed at developing a member-contributed case study library. We hope to launch the framework for this in early 2014. So as Christine already said, to learn more about the division or to become a member, visit planning.org slash division slash urban design. Today our speaker, Richard Longstreth, a noted author and professor, will present his recent work on the subject of post-World War II suburban tracts and how preservationists and others perceive and approach these comprehensively constructed residential communities with an awareness of historic context and treatment approaches. 
This is partic particularly useful to us as planners as part of the broader retrofitting and redevelopment process encouraged by planning. On October 4th, the division will present speakers Carl Morris and Sarah Woodworth for a discussion on calculating developer contributions. On November 1st, the division will present architect, author, and professor June Williamson for a discussion on designing suburban futures. And on November 8th, the division will present city planner, designer, and author Jeff Speck for a discussion on walkable cities. Now I would like to formally introduce today's speaker, Richard Longstreth. Mr. Longstreth is a professor of American studies and is the director of the graduate program in historic preservation at George Washington University. He has written extensively on 20th century subjects, including city center to regional mall, architecture, the automobile, and retailing in Los Angeles, 1920 to 1950, published by MIT Press, the drive-in, the supermarket, and the transformation of commercial space in Los Angeles, 1914 to 1941, also by MIT Press, and The Department Store Transformed, 1920 to 1960, by Yale University Press. His new book, titled Looking Beyond the Icons, A Legacy of Architecture, Landscape, and Urbanism from the Recent Past, is due for release by the University of Virginia in 2015, and his collection of color photographs of 1970s American roadside architecture will be published by Rizzoli next year. Over the past 30 years, Mr. Longstreth has taken an active role in preserving numerous buildings from the mid-20th century. His work is well regarded and is widely referred to by historians and preservation planners working in the technical process. The Urban Design and Preservation Division is excited to welcome Richard Longstreth as today's speaker. And I will hand it over to Christine and our esteemed speaker. Richard, are we ready to go over there? Yes. Uh, can you do you have the visuals now? Yes, we do. Good. Good. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's it's a great pleasure to um, uh, to be here in Silver Spring and to talk to uh, uh, a national uh, audience uh, of uh, people who uh, share an interest uh, I've had for some years in a subject I think is of uh, of, um, uh, of great importance. Uh, and bear with me for a minute while I, that isn't right. I think these are in a different order than I planned. Um, there. Uh, so I'm sorry, it's going to be a little bit choppy um, uh, going through the visuals, but that's, uh, that, that's all right. Uh, <clears throat> I should uh, tell you a little bit about how I got uh, interested in, uh, in this uh, subject and, and by way of a confession. Uh, I grew up in, in Central Bucks County in the 1950s. Uh, a little to the south of us was Levittown, Pennsylvania, uh, under construction from 52 to the late 50s. Uh, and uh, something that had little precedent in the way of, uh, of scale. Uh, my parents thought it was the end of civilization as they knew it. Uh, and so did my father was an architect, uh, I should say, and so did many of their, uh, of their friends. I was fascinated uh, at uh, age six or so by uh, by um, uh, earth moving equipment, construction equipment, the larger, the noisier, the smellier, the better. Uh, but uh, my parents predicted that Levittown, like many other people at that time, uh, that Levittown would become a slum, uh, that it was uh, not conducive to good family life, to healthy marriages, uh, to child rearing, or, or any number of other things. And in this capacity, they really um, uh, 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 they were very much uh, in sync with uh, uh, sociologists uh, uh, later on, like uh, uh, William White and, and John Keats, who uh, in the 50s uh, published a lot of railing uh, studies of a post-war suburban uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, uh, here you see an image of uh, San Lorenzo in California, uh, but it's the sort of thing that was uh, put in uh, in, um, in, in innumerable articles uh, and uh, books uh, 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 by planners, uh, architects, as well as uh, sociologists, by critics of many stripes uh, that were railing against uh, 
uh, the post-war suburb as an anonymous uh, place, as a cheap, jerry-built uh, place, as a place uh, that was uh, not going to be really uh, conducive to the progress of civilization, uh, uh, but perhaps uh, quite to the contrary. Instant slums uh, and all that, um, uh, and also all that sort of business. Usually, these images were posted anonymously by me, by which I mean that uh, the, the community uh, wasn't uh, identified, uh, certainly the builder wasn't uh, identified. Uh, San Lorenzo Village, which you see here, was by David Bohannon, who was one of the, uh, the leaders uh, nationally among home builders uh, in, um, uh, uh, in setting standards for uh, large-scale uh, volume building, he, uh, he being based in the San Francisco uh, Peninsula. Uh, but uh, his work attracted uh, national attention uh, uh, among, uh, among, his, uh, uh, among his colleagues. Or, or an image uh, such as this, one of a series in a famous uh, sort of expose of, of, of look at how the land is being laid to waste by uh, little boxes made of ticky-tacky, as the song uh, uh, later uh, went on. Again, anonymously, but this happens to be uh, Lakewood, California. Uh, in um, uh, uh, not uh, between LA and um, and Long Beach, uh, and along with the two Levittowns on Long Island and in Pennsylvania, one of the largest uh, scale uh, developments of single-family houses uh, ever um, uh, uh, ever uh, uh, ever achieved in the United States, uh, and the uh, and the image which was usually used. Uh, as fodder for derisive comments uh, uh, really tells us from a historical perspective all sorts of things about uh, a system of mass production uh, of housing uh, which um, uh, uh, the Levitts took credit for by and large but like many things they uh, had a lot to do with refining and ramping up the scale of, of development but they were not fundamentally uh, innovators but the process as they and others described it, which actually um, uh, appears to have uh, occurred with a, uh, a Los Angeles developer named Fritz Burns uh, in the early 1940s, uh, was, uh, uh, if you will, uh, the assembly line in, in reverse. Or in other words, rather than the workers remaining stationary and performing the same tasks uh, on uh, objects, automobiles, whatever that they might be, uh, that were moving on uh, on uh, on conveyor belts or the like, uh, that the uh, uh, the objects remained stationary, and it was the work crews uh, that went uh, from one house uh, to another, uh, doing a very small um, uh, a series of uh, of tasks, uh, but uh, very efficiently with uh, lumber already assembled on site, as you see there, um, uh, uh, moving along, which uh, enormously reduced the cost. Uh, of um, uh, of uh, uh, of production, uh, so that even images that are that are um, uh, uh, that are uh, oftentimes thought of as as uh, uh, as um, uh, as uh, uh, are cast, I should say, in a negative uh, way, uh, can have a very positive um, uh, or can yield a lot of information, really about uh, what the um, uh, what the subject is about. Uh, I have um, uh, my, my the, the change in my feeling about post-war suburbs uh, began to occur when I was a senior at the University of Pennsylvania, and being a glutton for punishment, undertook uh, writing a guidebook to Philadelphia area architecture as a last semester senior project. Um, uh, it took a few more years to get published, and unfortunately, all the um, uh, all the areas outside of of the city of Philadelphia got omitted. Uh, but it was then that I, in the course of that, that I traveled to Levittown, Pennsylvania once again, uh, and it seemed like everything my parents had said was so awful about it really, uh, really didn't exist. It was a fascinating community in many respects. I certainly could have included it in the guide, and it would have been had, um, uh, had uh, uh, Bucks County and other surrounding counties been part of the equation. Uh, but it, it helped, the whole experience helped nurture an interest in, in housing uh, that has uh, uh, to which I have devoted a fair amount of time in uh, in, um, uh, in recent years writing about Levittown, Pennsylvania. Finally, in uh, a book edited by Diane Harris called Second Suburb, 
uh, and also in, in a couple of uh, for case and case studies and a couple of uh, forthcoming uh, pieces uh, on um, uh, a uh, Montgomery Car County, Maryland uh, suburban track uh, called uh, called Twinbrook. Uh, I've also uh, uh, really been spurred to do this uh, work through um, uh, projects that I've developed for uh, some of my graduate students beginning in 2000 when we looked at uh, a later Levitt development, Bel Air at Bowie in, uh, uh, in Prince George's County, Maryland, uh, and uh, in more recent uh, uh, years um, in Montgomery County, uh, and then um, uh, the African-American suburb of Nauk in Arlington County, Virginia, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and uh, then uh, another African-American, uh, what became an African-American suburb uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, St. Pleasant, also in, in Prince George's County. And uh, all of this uh, work by my students and by myself has underscored uh, really some key things that these communities need to be looked at, just like neighborhoods in a city need to be looked at on a on a case-by-case -case basis. The generalities uh, only go so far. Each of these places has its own uh, story uh, and its own distinct uh, features. The um, uh, uh, Vidart that is often hurled at uh, the post-war suburban phenomenon by its critics that it's all homogeneous uh, is a batch of bunk. Uh, uh, you only have to look at the real estate pages of a major daily newspaper in the 50s and 60s uh, or to drive around these places to see the incredible uh, variety of housing stock uh, that was produced during the post-war era and the uh, generation or so uh, following, uh, uh, following uh, World War II. Uh, which brings up a point here is Lakewood, the way uh, it looks today, uh, a, um, uh, a large uh, and, and incidentally a, a separate municipality uh, from the start uh, that, was, um, uh, that was intended. Uh, in this case, as many such tracks uh, are, um, uh, are not. But few people visit uh, these places unless they live there or have uh, friends there uh, uh, 50 to 60 years uh, after they've been uh, completed. Uh, uh, many of these places uh, have, uh, have aged very well uh, and are very important uh, as uh, places of residence for a rather broad segment uh, of American society. Uh, from a historical perspective, which is how I uh, try and approach uh, my work and the work uh, at GW that I, uh, uh, I direct, uh, these were very special places uh, from, uh, uh, from the start. Uh, uh, they represented to a generation uh, that had lived through World War II uh, and the Depression. Uh, 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 most of them experiencing uh, hard times, and many of them uh, not born to families of means uh, even during the 1920s, uh, a sea change uh, in their lives, not only uh, in terms of a physical environment, they were now able to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, occupy uh, and uh, partake in, uh, but also uh, in terms uh, of uh, uh, their careers uh, and the dynamics uh, of community action uh, 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 with which uh, they were uh, able to, uh, to involve themselves. Uh, it represents in many ways a high point uh, in the American experience where the, uh, 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 perhaps the largest percentage uh, of our population uh, has been able to uh, has been able to partake in that long-standing uh, American dream uh, of a freestanding uh, single-family house uh, set in its own yard with at least a certain degree of, of, of sylvan attributes uh, to uh, the landscape, the immediate landscape of one's property, uh, but the larger landscape uh, of the um, uh, of a tract uh, as uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the generation that, uh, despite uh, John Keats, um, uh, despite uh, Holly White, despite uh, Lewis Mumford uh, and other, many other uh, uh, critics uh, of the period, uh, uh, this generation flocked to these uh, developments. The uh, notion that uh, developers were uh, cramming this down the um, uh, the mouths, as it were, of their 
uh, market is um, uh, is dead wrong. Again, the variety of options uh, was um, uh, was uh, uh, as large as it ever had been uh, for entry level uh, housing, and, and considerably larger than in many uh, uh, than in many periods of the past. And this was a new mass market, uh, too, one that had. Um, uh, that a lot of people thought was emerging during the 1920s uh, when actual income um, uh, of the middle class, at least of the non-rural population, uh, didn't move very much at all, uh, uh, but really was occurring uh, in the post-World War uh, uh, II area where many people uh, formerly of, 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 of modest uh, means were uh, not only ambitious, uh, but were becoming upwardly mobile uh, by virtue of the uh, of the support they were getting as um, uh, of veterans uh, through uh, uh, through education, the mobility uh, they had through uh, now uh, standard use, uh, everyday use of of the uh, 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 automobile, uh, and um, uh, and uh, people who had. Uh, in many ways felt that the, the world was um, uh, at their fingertips. Uh, and, uh, and places such as, uh, as Lakewood uh, uh, embody that and epitomize it uh, in many ways. Now let me do the roulette wheel again, yes, um, uh, easily enough. Uh, I wanted to show you, it, I think it's very telling, um, uh, if, uh, if people who moved into Lakewood or Levittown or Twinbrook here or uh, you name it, um, uh, 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 middle class uh, suburban tract of the 50s, 60s, um, uh, consider this such a great improvement. Where have they lived before? Or more to the point, in many cases, uh, what were comparables of the last housing boom, uh, which did indeed occur during the 1920s, uh, even though the real estate market was more uh, ambitious uh, than uh, prudence uh, uh, and real estate practices were more ambitious uh, or reckless uh, than prudence uh, would have dictated. Uh, uh, these are, uh, um, uh, uh, this is a street, 188th Street in Queens, um, houses uh, built in the 1920s, uh, spec houses uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, in vast numbers, and it was in the 1930s often aerial views of these tracks that were used by uh, 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 those who called for housing reform. Uh, showing uh, how uh, how awful of uh, the um, uh, of the status uh, quo was, uh, and uh, I'm not um, using this comparison uh, in a negative sense because uh, in the 1920s this too uh, meant upward mobility for many people who had uh, previously led uh, lived in tenements uh, in uh, uh, in New York, just as many people who uh, moved to Levittown, Long Island or Levittown, Pennsylvania after World War II uh, had lived in tenements and walk-ups, uh, in, um, uh, in uh, row houses, in boarding houses, uh, and the like. Uh, uh, many of them uh, old building stock, which can be great uh, if it's properly preserved, uh, but uh, with under uh, maintenance and the like uh, can be less than a desirable uh, environment. Uh, and uh, this represented, if you, th if you compare it with a uh, a one-bedroom or two-room, uh, 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 two-bedroom um, uh, uh, walk-up apartment along a trolley line from 1900 or thereabouts. Uh, this represents a very capacious um, uh, abode, uh, indeed, with the uh, porch uh, now uh, appropriated uh, as a uh, as a sunroom uh, and the attic appropriated uh, for one or more uh, extra bedrooms. Uh, space between the houses occupied by driveways going down to garages, which indicates the market was uh, one that could afford an automobile, as great numbers of Americans could by uh, the 1920s, uh, although the spatial order here is really dictated uh, by rail transportation. People of moderate means could buy into Queens uh, like this because of the IRT uh, and its uh, elevated lines, which were extending out from Manhattan to Long Island. Uh, during the early 20th century and, and, and made commuting by rail, um, uh, 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 high-speed elevated rail, not just uh, streetcars, um, uh, fast uh, and efficient uh, and uh, affordable. But they also had automobiles, like many people had automobiles uh, in the 1920s uh, for, um, uh, uh, for recreational purposes. 
uh, primarily. Let's see, I don't think it's going to be that way. Uh, where, yes, here we are. Uh, or, or another comparable from the 1920s. These are in the, um, uh, on the north side of Chicago, North Ashland uh, Avenue, one of the great north-south uh, thoroughfares of that um, uh, uh, city and, and the major car route, um, uh, that is streetcar route, uh, uh, once upon a time. Uh, and here, too, uh, there was a great uh, a boom in the 1920s of um, uh, a middle-class uh, walk-up uh, apartment, uh, apartment houses, uh, which for many of these folks, uh, again, represented uh, a step up. Uh, from what they were uh, used to, but again, far denser conditions in here uh, where uh, probably very few of the initial occupants owned an automobile. Uh, they relied on the streetcar and the streetcar system that connected uh, very effectively with the elevated system uh, in Chicago uh, that could uh, take them almost anywhere to work, uh, uh, to shop, uh, uh, and the like, but where conditions were far uh, too dense uh, to uh, include them. Um, uh, a large segment of the population, uh, of a uh, large segment of uh, uh, automobile uh, owners, and again, I'm not speaking about any of these uh, with uh, uh, with negative implications at all. My feeling is that many, many, many forms of housing uh, can provide decent housing uh, for lots of uh, different people. We know even today, but tenement housing, properly uh, rehabilitated in Hoboken or in Manhattan or in Holyoke, Massachusetts, or whatever. Uh, can uh, become uh, a good um, affordable housing or even upscale housing. I only want to emphasize the, um, uh, of the, the difference and the perceptual difference uh, to uh, 20 and 30-somethings, which was a large part of the post-war market, uh, 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 between uh, what uh, and others uh, were doing uh, in outlying areas uh, and uh, what they saw uh, as, uh, as the norm. This has a social uh, dimension uh, as well, which I want to bring up in a minute. But first, have to, there, uh, have to get the right side. Now, right after the war, uh, facing an, oh, thank you, uh, facing uh, an acute housing shortage, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, with people with, uh, uh, who were, shall we say, undercapitalized at that point, who had very little uh, means at their disposal, even though both the VA and the FHA allowed, with a 30-year mortgage, uh, allowed for uh, a very lenient terms, no money down, and all this sort of thing. A lot of work was quite modest. And here you see houses in North Charleston, South Carolina, uh, that are good examples of what was built uh, uh, in, in great numbers um, in, in many parts of the country uh, during the mid to late um, uh, 40s uh, and end of the 1950s uh, 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 as well. But uh, uh, be they ever so humble, seven, 800,000, uh, seven, 800 square feet uh, that um, uh, uh, they still uh, represented for people who maybe during the war had lived in trailers and temporary uh, uh, dwellings of uh, one sort or another in barracks and Quonset huts uh, uh, in their parents' uh, apartment or uh, in a friend's uh, boarding house or whatever uh, uh, represented a, a major step upward and and we can we can chart uh, housing progress um, you're going to see these slides so often you'll be really be sick of them I'm sorry uh, we can chart housing progress uh, by um, uh, almost by the year, not, and when I say housing progress, uh, it not only means uh, 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 larger houses uh, uh, with uh, more uh, amenities, um, uh, uh, but also a, a population that is uh, beginning to come of age, uh, beginning to have larger families, uh, and beginning to have more means uh, at their disposal uh, to afford. So. Uh, from the early 1950s on, we see more in the way of, uh, of larger lots, uh, more commodious houses. This is a very small tract, uh, and many of them were small. This, uh, this is in East Providence, Rhode Island, uh, uh, and uh, it's just a, a local builder uh, uh, doing a tract of about 20 houses or so. And this actually represents the norm uh, in terms of, uh, of what many builders were doing. And yes, a number of them. Uh, we're ramping up now. The Federal Housing Administration uh, made, the, made it possible for them to borrow other people's money in a safe, controlled uh, 
um, uh, a mortgage environment uh, in order to um, uh, in order to work at a larger scale. But uh, many post-war developments are, are are quite modest sort of add-ons uh, to um, uh, to existing communities. But it it gives you a good sense of of, of the uh, expansiveness uh, of these places. These are one-story ranch houses, probably no more than uh, 1,200 square feet, uh, if, um, uh, if that, but on generous um, uh, 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 lot sizes, all of which uh, was made possible uh, be, uh, uh, by virtue of, uh, of the uh, automobile tracks that were absolutely uh, impractical uh, uh, for residential or many other forms of development. Uh, when the reliance was on uh, uh, trains or elevated railroads uh, or even interurban trolleys, uh, let alone trolleys and buses, uh, prior to World War II, um, uh, uh, now and and have been used primarily as as, as farmland or uh, other uh, other kinds of related rural functions, uh, uh, now um, uh, at least for a while, uh, uh, become readily available are relatively. And expensive uh, and paving roads and, and the like uh, is in the long run a lot less um, uh, cost-consuming than uh, laying rail lines uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, for transportation. Uh, so that uh, 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 as a result, lot size could increase uh, and increase significantly, um, at least in, in in most parts uh, of the country. Uh, and one even finds, let's see, there we go, magically. Uh, that uh, by the uh, late 50s, uh, uh, end of the uh, uh, 1960s, some tracts of, of, of very generous size. This is in uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, near Falls, uh, near Falls Church, uh, and, and catering to uh, a, a, a relatively uh, affluent uh, crowd uh, uh, in this um, uh, case, both house size and the nature of the lots, the winding streets, the, uh, the, um, uh, the builder, uh, saving a number of existing trees um, uh, uh, in the process, which is actually more, more builders did that than um, uh, is often uh, is often uh, realized uh, uh, to create an open, informal, verdant, uh, and, um, uh, and 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 private uh, in many ways uh, uh, environment that seemed to many people uh, to be uh, the absolute uh, antithesis uh, of uh, the urban one uh, they had left. And again, I'm not positing one is inherently better uh, than the other, far from it, uh, but simply trying to uh, uh, reflect um, the, um, uh, uh, the attitudes uh, of the time, uh, or here also in Fairfax County, um, uh, uh, where uh, a variety, variety of effect, uh, especially once the planting started to uh, mature, a uh, variety of effect, not just through the housing, but through the landscape itself, uh, was um, uh, uh, was a uh, a key uh, component and very important in the way people uh, uh, perceived these places uh, and uh, and maintained it. Significantly, uh, the at least my uh, uh, some of my research on Twinbrook has is really uh, here in Montgomery County has really underscored that. Significantly, a very large portion of this population uh, had never had to think about a yard before. Uh, they had never known uh, a yard. Uh, they might have gone to the country uh, uh, for a fresh air camp or something like that as, as children, or maybe with their family on a few outings. Uh, but rural or, or at least pastoral environments were uh, the antithesis of what many of them uh, had um, uh, had experience, let alone uh, how to uh, maintain a house uh, and uh, maintain uh, a yard uh, and the like. And a number of developers, um, uh, the Levitts were very astute about this, but uh, uh, we find it in a number of much smaller uh, scale cases uh, as well, um, uh, uh, or through community associations that are formed, where it is put out in terms of you know, what, what, what plants are hardy? What plants do well uh, in the climate? What plants, uh, you know, flower? Uh, what plants do this? What plants do that? Um, uh, how to take care of your lawn? How to prune uh, trees? Sometimes contests with neighborhood associations are, uh, are formed in terms of um, improvement by building a rear terrace or something of that 
uh, nature and outdoor private space uh, that partakes of the, uh, of the, uh, of, of the landscape uh, in, um, uh, in which it was uh, set. Uh, so this uh, really represents uh, something of a quantum leap, uh, not only just in the experience, but then in the activities that are necessitated uh, by that uh, experience uh, for um, uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, many people. There's also a planning component uh, of this, which is uh, interesting. Now, even before World War II, uh, the Federal Housing Administration is uh, setting out guidelines for the, sub the planning of suburban uh, tracks. And if you want to get an insured mortgage as a, as a developer, um, uh, you might be wise to follow uh, uh, some of these guidelines, but they were essentially uh, the nature of it, that subdivisions should, um, uh, should be sympathetic and, and to the degree possible follow the topography. As many things done in, in, in the early 20th century, many urban developments in the early 20th century, let alone the 19th, uh, were, um, uh, were not. And rather than uh, simply extending uh, the orthogonal grid system, which did persist um, rigorously uh, persist in Southern California during the post-war period um, uh, in the Lake Woods and San Fernando Valleys and Orange Counties of that, uh, of that part of the world. Uh, in most other places, the FHA's guidelines of, of, of bearing uh, of a layout uh, of streets to have a kind of visual variety, which you saw in the two previous uh, I images, um, uh, were, uh, were followed especially by the 1950s, as again the market was a little bit more affluent uh, and uh, a little bit pickier. Uh, they just didn't take the first house that was available. The supply was beginning to catch up with the demand, uh, and this sort of raised the bar for uh, a number of house builders to uh, improve uh, the quality of their work. Indeed, site planning could be key in Levittown, Pennsylvania, which you see here uh, in an aerial view. Uh, is is um, uh, is a is a uh, is a major illustration of that. Where uh, uh, running up and down the center of the image, there you see uh, a divided uh, a divided highway, Levittown Parkway. Uh, this was a, a through route. Uh, Levittown was over 17,000 houses, uh, and even though it was uh, in uh, three townships and one borough, uh, it was never its own jurisdiction. Uh, that uh, the Levitts tried to plan it to the best of their uh, abilities as if it was uh, a, a, a community uh, in its own right. And then there are cross streets, some of which, uh, uh, which run laterally uh, across the slide. And you can see several of those uh, uh, as well. Some of them were existing. Uh, many others uh, were laid down. But the key thing uh, is that uh, of these uh, through routes, uh, by and large, are separate uh, from the neighborhoods, uh, if you will, the various uh, subdivision tracks uh, that are laid out uh, in stages. Levittown took uh, over six years to build, um, uh, uh, laid out in, uh, in stages so that one has to, if you're going from the Levittown Parkway again, from the bottom of the slide, go up to the second cross street on your right, uh, and you see that it's uh, just really a little dog leg uh, that connects uh, to another street, uh, and that's as a buffer for uh, through traffic and also slowing traffic down. That's out of intent. Uh, and then the street to which that dog leg connects uh, runs around the periphery uh, of that neighborhood. And there are a couple of other dog legs that connect it to, um, uh, uh, to uh, through streets. Uh, and, but then, aside from that ring road, uh, if you will, around which uh, houses are fronted, uh, that all the other streets simply connect from one point of that ring road to another point of that ring road or to another one of the interior streets. Uh, again, a way uh, of uh, slowing traffic down uh, and uh, ensuring that uh, uh, virtually everybody who drives along those streets uh, is going to live there, is going to be visiting there, is going to be making the delivery there, or doing repairs there, uh, or something uh, of that sort to minimize uh, through traffic and never uh, to have houses fronting major thoroughfares, always secondary uh, or uh, a tertiary, um, uh, a tertiary streets. Uh, uh, like most things the Levitts did, this is not original to Levittown, Pennsylvania. They probably cribbed it from a 
um, a wartime, major wartime housing project, Linda Vista, uh, outside of uh, San Diego. But li the Linda Vista plan is the only, uh, and that was built as temporary housing, uh, but that's the only other time I've, I've, I've uh, 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 prior to this that I've uh, seen this uh, uh, very ingenious way uh, of, um, uh, of uh, uh, handling and quieting uh, traffic flow, as it were. One that also, as, as you can see, uh, while uh, not wildly curving, uh, uh, still adds a fair amount of variety uh, to the experience of going through those streets, particularly um, uh, after, as you see today, uh, a after, the, uh, uh, after the planting grows up, uh, natural creek beds were, uh, were uh, uh, kept uh, and became spines uh, for parkland. Uh, and here in one of the neighborhoods filled with the largest models that Levitt was doing for his Pennsylvania development called the Country Clubber, uh, you see great swaths uh, of open space uh, at the periphery. Uh, there's a creek bed where the trees are uh, on the left. And this is, you see, not active recreational space, but really passive uh, uh, space uh, that uh, adds to, enhances uh, the uh, of a quality, uh, of a caliber, uh, of, of a place. Building on the volume that they did, the Levitts could afford to use space uh, fairly generously. Uh, a developer doing several hundred houses rather than 17,000 probably could not do as much, although uh, many were still concerned with tapping into um, uh, existing topographical forms, parks and the like. Joseph Gearhart at uh, Twinbrook in Montgomery County uh, 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 did that, even though uh, his development uh, included well, it was about uh, 1,000 houses or 1,500 houses, uh, uh, something of that sort, a small fraction of Levittown, uh, but still uh, tapping into the Montgomery County park system uh, was a, uh, a crucial part of the equation, uh, which brings up another point, and that is uh, now for a large segment of the middle class, the kind of amenities that real estate developers uh, had done uh, beginning at the turn of the 20th century for an elite market were now available um, uh, uh, to them, uh, beginning with, uh, um, uh, uh, beginning with uh, the Bowden's Roland Park, uh, out, then outside of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, and most famously with J.C. Nichols Country Club District, um, uh, in and adjacent to Kansas City, Missouri, and then into Johnson County, Kansas. Uh, these are celebrated developments, uh, uh, largely uh, tailored to the upper middle class uh, and to the well-to-do. Uh, and uh, uh, comprehensive planning uh, was, um, uh, was uh, uh, touted uh, as a way to enhance uh, long-term property values. And comprehensive planning uh, included uh, you know, restrictions on on on, uh, on house size. Both you, you know, it has to be so big, but it can't be too big uh, for the lot. Uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, obviously, on function and in the form of zoning uh, uh, of one sort or another, but also meant uh, providing adequate roads, adequate places for for, for recreation, adequate places for worship, uh, adequate places for education, uh, be they schools, libraries, uh, or whatever. Um, uh, a uh, a comprehensive uh, plan or a guaranteed neighborhood, as, uh, as one uh, uh, developer in Southern California uh, called his very exclusive work in Palos Verdes um, uh, in, the, um, uh, uh, in the 1920s. Uh, this uh, is now uh, in a lot of the best of these uh, tracks, irrespective of size, uh, really an integral part uh, of the equation. It's perhaps no uh, uh, no um, uh, coincidence that the Levitts had really achieved national recognition in, in among home builders prior to World War II uh, for, cater, uh, for catering to the upper middle class market uh, on Long Island uh, and incorporating many of those uh, features which now um, uh, get uh, applied uh, on a much larger scale, especially in Pennsylvania. Uh, the uh, Levittown Long Island was not intended to be what it became uh, and has all sorts of bumps and warps and, uh, and the like as a result. But Levittown, Pennsylvania uh, was, um, uh, uh, was a, a, a key uh, a part of the equation. Uh, and here you have one of many playgrounds. There were swimming pools uh, uh, originally. 
Uh, and, and, and not only did the developer provide a, a lot of these, but then also tried to uh, set up the means by which uh, the community uh, could take control uh, over uh, management uh, of all of these. We have wonderful accounts uh, uh, nationally um, uh, uh, from the 1950s, uh, and it was uh, uh, echoed in the work that I, uh, I did in, in, in Twinbrook about how a lot of these, again, most of the people living here are young, and they've never been together before. Usually before you moved into an established neighborhood, right, even if it was fairly new, uh, uh, and if you were uh, of uh, Italian origin, uh, it would probably be with other people of Italian origin, or Polish origin, or one thing or another. Uh, uh, if, you were, uh, if you were Catholic, it might be in a neighborhood uh, where there's a high percentage of Catholics. None of that happened, at least among the white population, uh, uh, during the post-World War II area. Uh, it became a great uh, a mixing ball um, uh, uh, that way, uh, so that you were, you were not in the old neighborhood, and there were no elders telling you what to do either. There was no hierarchy. Uh, everybody was, uh, in very short order, sort of uh, dumped in a place, um, uh, if you will, um, uh, very quickly. Uh, and, uh, and the accounts uh, that uh, I've found, and I'm sure there'll be many more uh, with further research in some of these places, of how these, a lot of these folks, not everybody of course, but a lot of these folks roll up their sleeves uh, and uh, begin to create community through neighborhood organizations uh, and uh, the like. Uh, Twinbrook significantly added to the population of Rockville uh, and got significantly uh, tired of the old, good old boy sort of rural uh, way in which uh, the municipal government in Rockville was uh, run, staged a revolution. A twin brooker became um, uh, the mayor uh, uh, and uh, began to change governance that way, not just for the neighborhood, uh, but for the, um, uh, the incorporated um, uh, community uh, as a whole. And I'm sure there are many other stories like that, whether it's uh, in governance uh, or whether it's through PTAs uh, uh, and a new level of investment uh, in your children's education uh, uh, for creating recreational places, uh, for establishing uh, uh, congregations uh, of, um, uh, of one sort uh, or another. All of these uh, are uh, an important uh, uh, part of the, um, uh, uh, an important part of the equation. Um, uh, the Levitts, even though they were Jewish, uh, would not sell to Jews in the 1930s in Long Island. Um, uh, it took a little while to find that out, uh, but uh, I was able to. Uh, and all of that begins to change uh, uh, after, uh, uh, after the war. Uh, and so there are synagogues as well as uh, uh, churches and other houses of worship, uh, but especially in the 50s, synagogues and churches uh, uh, serving uh, of the same community, uh, and it becomes, and I think I even have a slide somewhere, any there, uh, in Levittown. Um, it's an Episcopal church, but there are Baptist churches and Methodist churches and, as I say, a synagogue, uh, and so forth uh, uh, down the line. Now, uh, the one group that was, uh, by and large, uh, excluded uh, from uh, all of this uh, was, um, uh, was African Americans. Uh, and, and a lot of this has, is really, it, it doesn't originate, but it's codified in FHA uh, policies beginning in the 1930s, even with garden apartments and the like. Uh, and uh, it's seen that if uh, a re new real estate, first of all, old developments are, are, are considered uh, bad investments, uh, which is a great shame. Uh, but if new developments are, quote, open, uh, uh, then they are considered uh, uh, bad as well, and the FHA, even after World War II, uh, becomes uh, a, a very um, a reluctant uh, door opener, uh, giving, um, uh, 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 ensuring mortgages uh, largely to white developers uh, who uh, want to plan uh, suburban tracks uh, for, <coughs> uh, for African Americans. Uh, this doesn't uh, change uh, for a good while, but what is changing in the 1950s, or I'm beginning to discover, uh, is that there were, in more cities than you would, you would guess, or more metropolitan areas, 
uh, than you would guess. Uh, There's some very significant uh, suburban development, none more so in, an, in its extent or in the mechanisms that were established to enable it uh, than what is um, uh, uh, generically referred to as Collier Heights uh, on the uh, uh, on the central west side of Atlanta, which encompasses a huge area and a great number of tracks. Uh, and here is uh, 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 one of them, Chickamauga Heights, uh, uh, built in the um, uh, uh, built in uh, the late 1950s, uh, and it had to do with um, uh, a, um, a what became a very strong coalition uh, with the uh, Atlanta. Uh, Urban League, uh, led by uh, Robert Thompson, uh, uh, with um, uh, two, uh, two African-American-owned uh, banks uh, and uh, one insurance company, uh, Atlanta Life Insurance Company, again, uh, uh, African-American-owned and operated, uh, that um, uh, enabled and one of the key builders, uh, Walter Aiken himself, uh, uh, black, um, uh, enabled him to get the money and enabled his market to uh, get the mortgages uh, in order to uh, uh, develop uh, on um, uh, on a large scale. Uh, now, not uh, Atlanta, as I say, is 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 is, is probably the most extensive uh, of uh, of this sort, uh, and uh, is an area that is just Collier Heights is an area just it's just beginning to be uh, appreciated by folks who don't um, uh, who don't live there, uh, but is. Uh, testament uh, to the fact that uh, uh, even though uh, there was very little written about it at the time, or some things that were uh, probably shouldn't have been said, like when Richard Nixon visited it uh, and said, "I didn't know they could live like this," or something, uh, uh, something uh, impolitic like uh, uh, like that. Uh, that um, uh, there are indeed many places where we continue to explore more in Prince George's County, which was uh, where a lot of this uh, uh, action in Glen Arden and the like. Uh, took place and, and eventually led to uh, one of the great transformations of of, um, uh, of, uh, of the great transformation one can say of, of Prince George's County uh, into being a, a large um, uh, uh, and prosperous uh, network of uh, suburban enclaves uh, where there's a very sizable African American uh, uh, population, uh, but that doesn't occur really. Uh, until the um, uh, late 70s, 80s, uh, and, and, and further on uh, down the pipe. So uh, by, by custom, by practice, by federal regulation um, uh, of the, uh, uh, the Collier Heights of the, uh, of the country, and I've found examples in Philadelphia, Princeton, New Jersey of all places, uh, uh, Savannah, Raleigh, uh, Dallas, as well known, New Orleans uh, and the like to greater or smaller extents, uh, that it is still also uh, an important part uh, of the equation. Now, why, why preserve all of this? Uh, I hope I've given you a little indication of historically how, how major uh, a phenomenon uh, this is uh, and how it uh, profoundly affected the landscape how it profoundly affected the lives of a generation that bought into it and continues to do so. Here in Montgomery County, uh, there was a sort of a low-end housing tract called Veers Mill Village, still exists on Veers Mill Road, uh, and, uh, and uh, this was just a little bit too low-end uh, for a lot of Montgomery County residents, business and, and, and political communities alike, uh, unite to to deride it. Uh, they even see a congressional investigation, say there's funny business with the developer uh, uh, and what he's doing and so forth and so on. Not all of it was built, but most of it was. Uh, it's still standing. Uh, uh, it's still very recognizable. Uh, it's, it's not glamorous, uh, but it provides uh, entry-level single-family houses uh, for uh, a, uh, a segment of the Latino population now and affordable housing. Uh, it's a key component. Uh, of, uh, of uh, making Montgomery County uh, not just, or keeping Montgomery County from being uh, a place uh, where you have to have a lot of wherewithal uh, in order to buy in that way, uh, and uh, very important uh, for the, uh, uh, the uh, long-term economic health, I think, of, uh, of any community. Uh, many of these in Collier Heights uh, are, are, are 
number of tracks in Collier Heights, uh, still um, uh, remain um, uh, enclaves of the black elite of, uh, of Atlanta. Uh, 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 and uh, there are many um, uh, uh, other uh, uh, subdivisions, tracks that were built for uh, middle class whites that have, uh, uh, some of them have become again far, uh, have got, uh, far more sought after than they were originally because uh, of the amount of land, the size of the houses, and all of this. Some others have sadly uh, deteriorated. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, that uh, the, I think the great majority of the post-war legacy uh, is still 50, 60 plus years later, uh, is, uh, still represents uh, places of choice uh, for a, a major segment of uh, American society. Uh, and very important, we can't afford to do this again. We can't afford to build that way. Land prices are too high. Construction prices uh, are too high. Uh, Entry-level houses, in many cases now, if they're new, uh, are uh, row houses um, uh, uh, called townhouses uh, by the developers since the 1960s, 50s, really, uh, trying to make them uh, an acceptable form again. And I'm not deriding all of those, but just saying uh, that uh, this, is, this is a renewable habitat that we uh, really uh, cannot afford to replace uh, uh, in many cases. It is a fabulous uh, uh, legacy and one uh, which, unfortunately, there is a study, and I'm not going to name it, um, uh, but there is a study a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, an environmental history of post-war uh, uh, suburbia, uh, which um, uh, echoes the 50s critics of how developers essentially rape the land and how, from an environmental standpoint, uh, uh, how a lot of it was really um, uh, very damaging. Uh, but after the bulldozers leave, after the developers leave, after people set in, improve their property as the plantings mature and so forth and so on, what if neighborhoods like this get replaced with, uh, 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 with uh, high-rise apartments? What if neighborhoods like this get uh, uh, replaced by uh, lots of pavement uh, uh, or even by walk-up apartments? And I'm not decrying in any way, shape, or form denser forms of development. There are appropriate places uh, uh, for um, uh, all of that. And there's, ade there's adequate place for all of that. Uh, but is any of that uh, going to uh, be kinder to our planet uh, than uh, the kind of uh, neighborhoods you see here, especially uh, if the houses are retrofitted uh, to be uh, more, uh, uh, more energy efficient. Uh, for uh, uh, places like suburban Atlanta, uh, suburban Washington, D.C., with uh, 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 um, uh, Montgomery County here, uh, for suburban uh, Chicago, uh, San Francisco, St. Louis, you name it, uh, uh, for any um, uh, uh, city, uh, um, uh, or for any major metropolitan area. In these outlying jurisdictions, the post-war legacy is in many ways uh, the most important part of that jurisdiction's heritage. Uh, it is a major epochal um, uh, uh, component uh, of outlying counties' uh, histories, and it's produced some of the most uh, interesting uh, development. And the, the sooner we recognize this from a historical perspective, but also uh, in terms of the value uh, many of these places have uh, for us today and for future generations, I think the better off we'll be. Uh, and I'm going to stop with that and, um, uh, and uh, uh, open the floor to questions. And I'm not sure how this works. Great. Thank you, Richard. That's wonderful. Um, I, I think maybe what we'll do is we'll take one question from our end on the webinar, um, and then we can finish up with any live questions. Um, so the first question that we have over here, redevelopment of suburbia will need to consider the wants, needs, and desires of millennial and Generation Z renters, homeowners. What strategies or approaches do you recommend that planners, urban researchers use to include these groups' perspective and envisioning the future? That's a, that's a hard question to answer because it, it has so many potential components, and I think 
uh, the, um, uh, and it can vary from place to place. Uh, there are many places in the country, I think, where uh, people who inhabit these tracks are very appreciative of them. Lakewood is, uh, is, a, uh, is a city uh, that uh, uh, is uh, very aware of and very proud of its, uh, uh, of its history. Levittown, Long Island is, a, is another place uh, that has uh, become that way. When uh, I and others were working on the Levittown, Pennsylvania book, uh, there was relatively little, uh, shall we say, public uh, cognizance, let alone appreciation of the history of a place or, or, or what it's like. Uh, Twinbrook, where we worked and I've worked subsequently, uh, has a high level of recognition, but not every place does. So part of it uh, maybe uh, in many cases with, with, with uh, the planning community, but also the preservation uh, community, and I think they should be closely intertwined, uh, to, um, uh, 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 to work at raising levels uh, of uh, consciousness. Oftentimes, if you grow up in a place, you take it for granted um, uh, and don't really think about uh, any of its special characteristics. Uh, and while you know the place uh, very well, better than most people, it can take an outside perspective to open some doors and make you think of a place uh, in a way you haven't um, uh, you haven't thought of uh, before. So it's both you know listening to people, but I think also taking a in many cases a proactive stand where it's warranted uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, opening doors to the public's knowledge of a place. Great. Um, Oh, Susie, do you have any questions from the live audience? Yes. Many of the first-time buyers um, decided to add additions to their houses later on to make their quality of life more comfortable. But now we're seeing a movement where these neighborhoods, the houses are being destroyed one by one and turning into McMansions, as I've seen off of old Georgetown Road. How do you feel about that trend, and what should we do in the way of curbing this or being more part of the design process? Uh, a national trend, although I am not sure, teardowns, uh, I'm not sure how many of, uh, of those things have been done since 2008. Uh, uh, and it may uh, be something of a, uh, of a breathing space, uh, at least. Uh, but uh, the, uh, it raises a, a serious question because uh, what was once relatively inexpensive uh, and affordable has, in cases in, 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 in prosperous metropolitan areas, uh, land values have, have, um, have uh, risen out of proportion to inflation and other, uh, other um, uh, 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 certainly to the, to the you know, income and, and, and the like. Uh, and so that there is, you know, uh, do I want a 1,200, 1,500-square-foot house? Uh, uh, do I want to pay uh, uh, some fabulous sum of money for it and then live in it uh, as well, especially if I, I can afford uh, more? And I think the answer is there, there are all sorts of creative ways uh, on, to which to, to add on to, uh, uh, to houses um, uh, of any period, any type, uh, for that matter. I mean, there's a limit in terms of size uh, and the like. Uh, but um, uh, uh, that certainly uh, through guidelines, through the establishment of conservation districts, if not through the establishment of conservation districts that limit the footprint of, of, of construction uh, on, on, on properties, uh, if not through historic districts, uh, can all be ways of, 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 um, uh, of uh, toning that down. Is, is Christine going to take another question? Yeah, I'll take another question. Um, From the online audience? Yes. You mentioned Levittown, PA. You didn't mention Fairless Hills, the project north of Levittown, that was built about the same time. What is your opinion of Fairless Hills? Uh, uh, yes. Um, well, Levittown, PA, was, was built because uh, the Fairless uh, works of U.S. Steel was... Uh, uh, slated for construction uh, close by, uh, and uh, I should say the, the, the Levitts only went to Pennsylvania. They were all set to do a higher-end 
community in Long Island after uh, really wanting to get out of the modern income uh, level development that uh, Levittown, Long Island represented. Uh, and then along comes the Korean War uh, and restrictions on construction. Uh, and if you're going to build houses, you have to build it in a priority area uh, according to uh, uh, priority according to the quote defense needs. Uh, and Levitt wisely, uh, Bill Levitt wisely um, uh, guessed that uh, uh, the Fairless Works would make that part of, uh, of Bucks County a, a priority area. He was right, but began, he had to buy up land before that uh, in order to make it affordable. Uh, and then U.S. Steel uh, uh, gets into the works uh, as uh, well uh, with uh, Fairless Hills. Benjamin Fairless was, the, uh, um, uh, uh, was uh, a young executive of, of uh, U.S. Steel for whom the plant was, um, uh, was um, uh, named. And another person uh, did the development, Seward Mott, who had been um, uh, 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 with the uh, FHA and had done some of the guidelines, had laid out Fairless Hills. Uh, and it's interesting because the, the intent of Fairless Hills was one for prefa real prefabricated housing uh, using what? U.S. Steel. Uh, uh, Gunnison Homes was the name of it, uh, of a company, uh, of a subsidiary. Uh, uh, and so U.S. Steel wanted to show that, that real prefab houses were, were, uh, were, um, uh, uh, were not only doable but uh, preferable. And there was, a, there was a great contretemps between the Levitts, um, uh, uh, nationally, between the Levitts and prefabricators. Uh, and um, as Alfred Levitt uh, said, who really did all the designing, or was in charge of all the designing, um, uh, you can prefab a lot of stuff, but you can't prefab the site. Uh, a major part of our costs are in the site, uh, uh, which is what led them to uh, pick up and adapt the, uh, for their huge scale construction, the sort of a moving assembly line idea uh, that I showed you uh, with the Lakewood uh, uh, illustration. Uh, so Fairless Hills is interesting in that it represents a fairly ambitious development um, uh, at the time for, uh, for, for uh, uh, prefab. Uh, one thing that Mott did not, uh, it's, it's much smaller, uh, it doesn't have the extent of open space, um, uh, and that Mott did not uh, separate uh, major traffic arteries uh, from residential development. So a lot of houses uh, are on arterials, uh, which if you've ever lived in that sort of situation, you know it isn't very pleasant. Uh, uh, even when there, you know, traffic isn't backed up in front of your house and you're trying to get out of your driveway. Uh, so that, um, uh, and I'm not saying uh, to just write off uh, Fairless Hills, but I am trying to underscore, far from it, but I'm trying to underscore uh, some of the differences between it and Levittown. And, and the point that each one of these has its own, uh, has its own story. We have any questions from the in-house audience? Yes. A lot of the ideas that you're uh, raising today uh, communities that are trying to preserve the kinds of things that you're talking about. Today's planners very much then accuse those communities of being nimbious because they're trying to preserve the community character, the things that make the neighborhood what it is. Uh, here in Montgomery County, Maryland, we have what's known as the Agricultural Reserve, which for those people who are fortunate to live out there, essentially protects those areas from future development and manage, allows those people to preserve their lifestyles. Uh, for the kinds of communities you're talking about here, of uh, suburban, in some cases pioneer communities, uh, would you support the idea of like a community conservation area or a neighborhood conservation area to sort of help those areas as well to maintain? I think anything that fosters conservation of neighborhoods uh, is uh, assuming uh, they are, you know, stable, you know, vital places. They're not in need of revitalization. Right. When uh, otherwise, uh, yes, good stable neighborhoods are an asset that should be conserved. Uh, I think that's fundamental to any kind of uh, good planning. Unfortunately, um, uh, they're usually rarely uh, recognized. Hmm? Unfortunately, they're rarely recognized when planning occurs. Well, it's just like maintenance, uh, you know, the least sexy uh, thing to which to allocate funds. No politician can cut a ribbon uh, on a bridge that's been well maintained, uh, but it saves uh, spending a lot more money uh, on reconstructing that bridge um, uh, down the pike. Uh, and so it, it may be beholden to planning departments to uh, give greater emphasis uh, to this. Uh, 
uh, because when you do that, uh, your constituents are doing a lot of the planning for you. Uh, and it's a good way to engage people uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, helping to control their, uh, their destiny. Uh, as far as NIMBYism uh, goes, that comes in many ways, shapes and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and forms. Uh, and I think uh, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it's something that is trying to keep people out, uh, it's probably a negative force. Uh, if it's something that's trying to protect something that, that uh, long-term uh, uh, residents value, uh, I don't see it as primarily a negative thing. I don't think it's an exclusionary thing. I think it's, uh, again, simply um, good conservation. I have the good fortune to work in the summers uh, in the Adirondacks, where uh, over the last 40 plus years now, there has been a huge contretemps between many um, uh, lifelong residents uh, and the Adirondack Park Agency, which administers the first regional zoning plan in the United States, uh, created in 1971 or two, I forget which, uh, which has seen, been seen by many long-term residents as, as, as a stricture, uh, preventing economic development and so on. That's beginning to change now because uh, the Adirondacks as a place where um, uh, uh, far more of the land remains wild than any other place east of the Mississippi uh, is being seen increasingly as an advantage, not just for the tourists who come there to hike or to boat or to whatever, uh, but uh, 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 for the economy and for, uh, for long-term residential communities. Ultimately, it's a balance. Uh, but having the agricultural areas uh, in Montgomery County um, uh, is uh, uh, which my predecessor Fritz uh, at GW Fritz Gutheim was was uh, uh, involved in. Uh, I think is good uh, 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 long range planning for the health of the uh, for the health of the county. Um, uh, so, I'll but I guess but it even gets to the irony in the rush to create walkable communities. We're ignoring the existing walkable communities. <laughs> Uh, yes, oftentimes uh, that can happen, uh, and 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 Washington is kind of a special case because, uh, uh, as metropolitan areas go, it's awfully prosperous. Uh, but you look at at you know many cities that are less so, uh, you know the Clevelands or whatever, the St. Louis's, the Omaha's or whatever of the world, uh, where there's so much existing infrastructure that is just so now underutilized, so many housing stock you could. Uh, you know, a good middle-class house from 1910 or so uh, would, if you had comparable quality materials and the like, cost a fortune now. Uh, and to see a lot of this fabric neglected and, uh, and decay uh, is, um, uh, is, uh, uh, is, I just think, a squandering of resources. Christine, do you have someone from online who'd like yes. to ask a question? Yep. Uh, what are the opportunities for these post-war communities to accommodate a reduction in the need for or reliance on the automobile? From an environmental perspective, we need to address for certain vehicle miles traveled issues. Well, nothing, um, uh, nothing beats living in proximity to work. Um, uh, and nothing seems to be more difficult uh, nowadays. Uh, the automobile has uh, has fostered that. Uh, it didn't necessarily uh, it didn't necessarily create it. Uh, and, but it isn't always necessarily use of the automobile. It's that uh, that the distances one has to travel for uh, uh, for employment, uh, for shopping, uh, or uh, for worship or for education or whatever uh, uh, can be made uh, can be made minimal uh, and that means not only automobiles are driving less but also uh, automobiles are um, uh, are maybe uh, used less often uh, for um, uh, uh, for various uh, things the idea of being able to walk to school uh, is a wonderful thing but a lot of state school uh, departments have have uh, have ramped up the requirements so that 
uh, any new school has to be built out really in the periphery to include everything on site, uh, which means everybody has to be bused to school and so forth and the like, which is uh, beginning to be challenged in, in some places. Uh, but it's simply an example of how outside forces can trigger this. I think a greater realization, and, and everybody, nobody wants to be on uh, the highway uh, uh, inching along bumper to bumper uh, for an hour and a half or whatever after uh, a work day. Uh, uh, so it's not uh, the, the kind of reliance we have on the automobile today is not one that uh, enhances uh, our lives in, in many routine uh, things. So I think a lot of it, and this really comes down to, to another kind of beyond physical planning, uh, but to, um, uh, to formulate strategies where the distances people have to travel uh, are less. Nobody thought about this, uh, has thought about this until, uh, until fairly recently, but I know. Uh, but it's uh, as metropolitan populations grow, it's a you know it's it, it's it's a it's a major deal. More time is squandered, more energy is squandered, and and, and the like uh, by uh, by um, uh, long distance um, uh, uh, commutes, uh, and that's for metropolitan areas. Rural areas um, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, it's very common to have people uh, commute 30, 40 miles each way. Uh, because the places of employment have become more centralized. Uh, they like to live in a small town, but don't want to. Um, but there's no place to work there, uh, so they have to drive to the nearest you know, large town, small city, uh, or wherever. And maybe that can uh, begin to um, uh, uh, change too. Driving under those circumstances can be uh, uh, somewhat more pleasurable, or at least uh, not quite as harrowing. Uh, but it's still there's the energy consumption and. Uh, there is the time, uh, and there's everything else that's a negative with that kind of long distance transfer. So I, I think the issue is the issue is a very important one, but it's not just sort of um, uh, you know retool. I, I think the automobile also will be uh, around for a long, long time. Um, uh, changes in automobile technology may make it a lot friendlier uh, to the environment that it is now. But I think too much of our uh, of our metropolitan and rural structure is such that we can't uh, just pull the plug on the uh, uh, on the automobile, uh, but have to take steps uh, again way beyond the realm of um, uh, of planning uh, to ensure that uh, automobiles of the future um, uh, uh, serve the planet's needs more adequately. Great. Um, I we're gonna our webcast program is gonna cut off here. Um, but we urge you to continue your Q&A on, on the live portion. But if I could just take one moment. Um, I know my screen is still black. I'm, we're having just, it's just one of those days. But I just want to make a few reminders, if I may, for our webcast folks. And then we're going to cut out, but you can feel free to continue your Q&A in the live portion. So I just wanted to make a comment. Um, again, thank you to the Urban Design and Preservation Division, Division for sponsoring this today. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, um, Wendy and Gary, and all of those folks that have helped out. Um, and you can get a recording of today's webcast at our YouTube channel, um, Planning Webcast. You can email me if you have any questions, planningwebcast at yahoo.com. Don't forget to log those CM credits, look for our future webcasts, and like us on Facebook. And that's it. Thanks, thanks everyone, um, for bearing with us with our late start and our, at some point, blank screens. Um, so thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. And um, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.